simply say, I am thankful that people like this are leading in California. He's the real deal. He's the real guy who understands what you do. And I would like for you to give him a heartfelt welcome from CSLA, Craig Chesler. inspiring time from last night's dinner, which was really, really amazing uh, to hear from the students, hear from the author, Jennifer, uh, and really begin to tie your importance to our education system uh, in a real profound way for our students. And uh, to hear from some of you the conversations I have had, let me just assure you that from State Superintendent Torlickson through me and our team, teacher librarians are intricately important and tied to what we need to do in the 21st century for our students. And uh, we can't do this without you. And the fact that we are 51st in the nation in the number of librarians per student is a disgrace. And it's immoral. And we have to change that. And those are easy words to say, but how do you back them up? And I don't know how many of you noticed uh, but earlier this month, uh, the Department of Education posted a new job posting in our, uh, our uh, Curriculum Frameworks and Instructional Resources Division for an Education Programs Consultant to consult with school districts, teacher librarians, professional organizations, parents about how to promote information literacy and technology in Title I schools especially, but all schools in California. Yes, we're bringing back the teacher <laughs> Because we have to lead by example, not just say the words. And so hopefully we're going to start to send some signals so we can get more administrators like Mary Jane out there to understand the importance of teacher librarians and how all of this is going to tie together for 21st century students. And it really is exciting. Proposition 30 is a game changer. And I cannot uh, emphasize that enough. Uh, part of my job in September and October was to look into the abyss of what would happen in Prop 35. You don't want to look into that abyss. Uh, things are bad enough after $20 billion in cuts after, over the last four years. And something that uh, when I'm really looking to depress uh, people, I, I remind them that we didn't start cutting from a time of growth and bounty. We had just done the getting down the fact studies that said that we were underfunding our schools by 12 to $15 billion a year. And from there, we cut $20 billion over four years. So we have a lot of work to do, and Prop 30 is not going to solve all those problems. But the voters in California, we believe, told us something very important uh, with their votes. Because it wasn't just Prop 30. It was passing over 85% of the school bonds on the ballot. And it was passing 16 or 17 of the 25 parcel taxes on the ballot. But let me add an asterisk to that. Because the fact that you have to get a two-thirds vote to pass a parcel tax is insane. And that is a policy that must change. Yes. And uh, if you look at those parcel taxes, and you had it set at 55% for passage, all but three would have passed statewide. So from Proposition 30 through school bonds, through parcel taxes, the voters of California spoke with a very loud and clear voice. Our schools are important. A 21st century is important, and it's time to stop the cuts to our schools. Now the question is, what do we do with that? And so we've had several different initiatives that Superintendent Torlickson has uh, put out there since uh, he became state superintendent. He started with a transition advisory team, and he brought this group together not to hold a party for him on his inauguration night, but to actually begin to lay out what a 21st century education in California is like. So we had 59 education business uh, school experts get together over a period of a few months and put together a blueprint for grade schools that focused on three major things. A focus on educating the whole child and not just the academic child. And you can't do that without a teacher librarian. It focused on 21st century skills being what we need to teach in our classrooms today. And 
as I'm going to talk about in a moment. You can't do that without teacher librarians. And it talked about educator excellence and the fact that we need outstanding educators, outstanding teachers, outstanding administrators in every classroom and every school um, around the state. And you heard what a great administrator looks like and understands earlier this morning. And we need to spread that because every one of our children, all 6.3 million of them, all up and down the state, deserves an outstanding teacher in their classroom and an outstanding administrator as a principal and a superintendent who get what a 21st century education looks like because it's not bubble tests and it's not about just remembering some trivia. It's about something deeper and something that you can provide. <laughs> And we have our challenges, and they're challenges. They're, 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 they're actually not just challenges, they're opportunities. Of our 6.3 million students, we have 1.4 million English language learners. 15 different languages with more than 5,000 students around our state speaking them as a primary language at home besides English. For far too long, we've looked at that as a problem. It's not a problem in the 21st century where learning more than one language is actually sort of a minimum base standard worldwide. We should be embracing this fact. And that's one of the things we learned in the Blueprint for Great Schools and one of the things that we think education technology can help our teachers deal with because there are some teachers around the state who are teaching English language classes with four or five different primary languages in their class. You're not going to be able to do that without some help and some assistance. But this is not a problem. This is an opportunity. But more than, more than half of our students come to school needing help to pay for their lunch in one way or another. One in four of our students, believe it or not, still come to school without some sort of health care coverage. One in five of our students come to school with a parent, with parents who did not graduate, not just from college, from high school. This, is, this means that our education system can't just point in the classroom and deal with everything there. We have to have a supportive environment. It has to be about the whole child. It has to be about a community school at large that helps our students because a hungry or sick child who hasn't had a decent meal in several days and is not sure where they're going to sleep that night is not going to do as well as uh, another student without some support. And you are a key part of the support So we have some complications. Uh, but one of the things that, as the economy improves, because of Proposition 30, uh, the Proposition 98 guarantee will help our schools get healthy more quickly than other parts of the state budget. So what are we going to do with that? And we have the blueprint for grade schools that I mentioned our transition advisory team put together. And within it, they made some recommendations that more work was needed in, in some areas. And so we've been implementing that over the last few months. Uh, education technology, educator excellence, STEM. Uh, we've been doing more work in those areas because of this key element of what a 21st century looks like and what 21st century skills are going to look like. And one thing I can tell you is we're not going to be able to do that if we continue to rank 47th in the nation in per pupil spending. We need to start adding even more, even after Proposition 30. We have to add more so we can't squander this opportunity that Proposition 30 gave us. We have to build upon it. We have to continue to explain what is happening in our schools and just how dire the situation is. Only 30%, and this is actually one of the reasons passing Prop 30 is so amazing, only 30% of California voters have a child in a California public school. We have not done a very good job talking to that other 70% until recently. And so we have people who are driving by our schools and the lights are on, Cars are moving in and out. Uh, those of our uh, community members who still get newspapers and see the interscholastic <laughs> scores in the newspaper, they've heard that there's some big talk of cuts, but they don't know just how bad it's gotten. They don't know we're 51st in the nation in the number of librarians. Trust me, I hear a lot about how, how much staff we have in our schools. Um, and then I go through the facts of how we're 47th in the nation in total staff to students. 47th. And this is California. And you talk about how we are, you know, 48th in the nation in the number of teachers, 50th in the nation in the number of guidance counselors. It's amazing learning's getting done at all. Not just that improvements continue to be made under these circumstances. 
So what have our task force has been telling us, including the Education and Technology Task Force that uh, Glenn has been a, been a part of, and our Arts Task Force that I'm still working on, and a few of our other our task forces, they're all telling us that we have some changing expectations for learning. A 21st century education is going to look different from what we've done in the past. What is important? What is the new context? What are we looking, what are business leaders looking to get from students as they graduate? An emphasis on the ability to communicate, the ability and adaptability to change, the ability to work in teams, preparedness to solve problems, the ability to analyze and conceptualize, the ability to reflect and improve performance based on that reflection, the ability to manage oneself and how one handles the day, the ability to create, the ability to innovate, and the ability to criticize. The ability to engage learning new things at all times. And the ability to cross borders of specialization. None of that's going to come from a bubble test. None of that's going to come from the way we've been trying to teach students recently under certain federal mandates. Something new is required. And to put this in another way, Dr. Linda Darling Hammond, who is a Stanford education professor and was the co-chair of Superintendent Torlakson's transition team, and the co-chair of our Educator Excellence Task Force because we keep asking her to do things and she thankfully continues <laughs> to say yes. In her last book, The Flat World in Education, she laid out in one quick paragraph what the new mission of schools in the 21st century is. And she talks about how the new mission of schools is to prepare students to work at jobs that do not yet exist, creating ideas and solutions for products and problems that have not been identified using technologies that have not been invented. That is a far different task for our schools than the one we have prepared our teachers to do, than the one we have set up our schools to do. But that is what the 21st century is going to look like. And thankfully, we started down the road of making changes to getting us there with the Common Core and the upcoming Smarter Balance Computer Adaptive Assessments. And let me assure you, that our Education Technology Task Force, and it wasn't just Glenn, <laughs> looked at some of these issues and one theme continued to come up. Who at the school site level, when we add technology to the classroom, when we implement our number one goal, no child left offline, 6.3 million students having access to a computer type device connected to the internet every day before during and after the school day. How are we going to do that? Who is going to be the education professional on the ground at every school site? Who's going to help manage that information? Who's going to help teachers learn how to teach with this new material? Because it can't just be putting textbooks on tablets. That's not the point. We can do much more with that with the use of technology. Who is that education professional going to be? It's going to be the teacher librarian, Thank you. if we know what we're doing. <laughs> Somebody on the ground has to be the person who's able to help our teachers get additional professional development, answer questions, help our students learn how to use, you know, even Google search. And we had a good conversation. <laughs> you can do it wrong. Trust me, I can see that. <laughs> With my own children. Um, there are, you know, who's going to teach about plagiarism? I got it. Who's going to teach about copyright? Who's going to help our students so they don't make career ending mistakes just a few years after they graduate? It's the teacher librarian. It's the only, it's, it, it makes sense. It's continuing the job of the teacher librarian. And I had this conversation at the table at which we sat last night. The teacher librarian has helped manage information. Now, there was a time when it was card catalogs. You know, we didn't stop using teacher librarians just because we were able to put everything on computers and search that way. No, we adapted and you adapted and became more efficient and were able to offer more to our, our students by through new searches. The job is still basically the same. It's managing information, it's teaching people how to manage information, find information, and do this type of work. And in a time when categorical flexibility is going to remain the talk of the day, we're not going to see, I don't believe, 
uh, specific programs, at least until this pendulum swings back 10 years from now or something like that. Right now, there's this flexibility is, is the code word in Sacramento and among administrators. So if we actually want something, if we want to see teacher librarians come back and uh, so that we're not 51st in the nation, uh, we're going to have to justify and argue and cajole. And uh, Su Superintendent Torlinson talks about this. I've been talking about it, not just in front of you. Uh, because we want our administrators to know, our business officers to know, our school board members to know that this is a key element of a 21st century technology. And the talk conversation about librarians came up in several of the groups during our Education Technology Task Force, for example. And it's come up in our Arts Task Force and our STEM Task Force. We need you. We need to expand your numbers. We can't just have one librarian in a school district. Exactly. That is not acceptable. <laughs> so what did our education task force, education technology task force want? Well, we want to make sure that all learners have an engaging and empowering learning experience both in and out of school. And this is important. We need to redefine learning as not just during the school day, it is before, during, and after the school day, a 24-7 model, because so much of our world is a 24-7 model. And digital learning is an essential approach to enabling all students to graduate from high school with the essential thinking and problem-solving skills to be competitive in the 21st century. And so improving the digital literacy of all students requires the development of digital learning resources and standards and we have to share them statewide. And part of that sharing is explaining the importance of teacher librarians because who is going to provide the professional development at each of our school sites? You know, we haven't even started teaching new teachers and how to teach in, a digital, in the digital age. How are we going to help our teachers who have been around for 10, 20, or 30 years learn these skills? One of the things we know from our Education Technology Task Force work is that if we just drop a bunch of boxes, in a classroom with no professional support, those boxes are going to remain unopened because teachers have pacing guides and all sorts of those other things <laughs> yeah, that we need. Exactly. So we need to provide help. We need to make this relevant. And we've seen throughout the state, in rural areas, urban areas, north, south, central valley, that when professional development is provided, training is provided, even the most reticent teacher embraces it by the end, because what do teachers want? To engage their students and help their students learn. That's what matters, and that's what, in the 21st century, the use of a digital device, that's how these kids work. Uh, this is how they think. And when you look at some of our policies, uh, one of the things that we've looked at in, in, the tech, in the Education Technology Task Force is, so much of our education policy for technology is predicated on the word no. <laughs> no, we may not access that program. That's no, right. we may not install that program. Oh my gosh, you could never conceive to let children use that. <laughs> but that's not how the world works right. in the 21st right. century. And we have an obligation as educators to help our students navigate the 21st century. To make sure they know copying copy and pasting from Wikipedia is not research. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure they know there are certain websites you shouldn't browse during the academic or work day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to know that, you know, that what we really want our students to do is to know how to find the facts. But then we need to teach them those critical thinking and creativity skills right. so they can use the facts that they may not have known when they walked through the door. And uh, Mick Founce, the county superintendent in San Joaquin County, will demonstrate this uh, on a couple of panels I've been on with him, where he will say, look, we tell everybody to turn these off. I'm not going to tell you to do that. I'm going to tell you to keep it in honor. While I'm talking, I want you to tell me about the reproductive activity of water buffalo by the end of my speech. <laughs> and you know what? Everybody can by the end of the speech, because you are too searches on, on Google or another search engine away from getting it. That's the world we live in. Now, it's what do you do with that information? And, and uh, thankfully, we don't go too far into those conversations <laughs> uh, on these panels. But he makes the point that in a world where we can do that, in a world where we can learn some basic facts about any subject at hand, 
Rememorizing facts isn't necessarily what's important now. It's what do you do with those facts? It's is it a credible source or not? And who is going to teach that at our school site level? Our teachers would love to have your help, and I think you know that. And uh, now we need to help you expand and get back to where we want to be in California so that we can do things. If we are going to move from textbooks to something more dynamic and something that is based in the cloud uh, so that our students can be more engaged and empowered and have more personalized learning, we're going to need more training and support at the school site level. If we are going to make sure that our students can access technology before, during, and after the school day, well, until we solve some problems with poverty and problems with the digital divide, you know what one of the elements of providing before, during, and after the school day internet access is going to be? It's going to be the library. Just like libraries provided books, <laughs> when books were the way information was transmitted. It's the same thing, only updated, we believe. We need to have champions who help us explain why this type of engagement is important to our students. We have the model school library standards, which would imply the use of something. <laughs> <laughs> and the model school library standards are mentioned by name several times in the memo that uh, the Education Technology Task Force uh, put together. And this is, you know, one of the uh, uh, frankly frustrating things about uh, the work that I've learned is that California is actually a leader in some of this thinking. We have the model school library standards. We came up with a lot of different programs that uh, we've cut in California, but other states are still very glad to use. And, and, and we have to stop doing that. We have to provide for our own schools and our own standards. Uh, we're going to need your help as we move forward because one of the things that our assessment team uh, talked about was that we need to have more personalized assessments and that goes from everything from digital badges and I don't know if you know what digital badges are but if you um, are, are play any games or you know for example if you have a, a Fitbit or another tracker of your steps if you get a certain number of steps or burn a certain number of calories you can get a little digital badge and yes I can tell you from experience you'll get up and walk at 10 o'clock at night if you're a few thousand steps short and get a <laughs> badge. But, our students can embrace this too. They've embraced it in the games that they play. Yes. And they can embrace it in the education they get. And uh, a digital badge is something that you can put on your Facebook profile, your LinkedIn profile, the social network to be named three years from now uh, profile. Uh, it can go on your resume. And uh, we've already done some work on the Mozilla Foundation, for example, is doing a great deal of work in this area to figure out how do you make sure that you have something that is uh, confirmable and links back to what the student did to deserve it. And our first demonstration project that we're working on right now is with something else that was in our blueprint for great schools, which called for adding a seal of biliteracy uh, to California diploma, diplomas. And we did that this year. And the seal of biliteracy goes to students who have demonstrated expertise in more than one language, which again should be something that is a good thing and not something that we consider a problem. There were about 10,000 students last year who did that. So it's a, si a manageable but sizable number, and we're going to figure out how to make the seal of biliteracy not just a gold seal on a diploma, but something that can go on an electronic profile so that students can use that not just to help get into college, but help get into their careers with a jump and a step up. Which, by the way, if we can help prove, that's another way to prove how relevant a K-12 education is to our students, to their futures which is a way to make sure they don't drop out. It's the way they take things more seriously. Uh, we're going to need uh, your help moving forward uh, with this professional learning culture that we need to create around the use of education technology. Uh, 21st century learners embrace it. Our teachers will embrace it. Uh, but it's fast moving. And you know, three years ago, who would have thought that tablets would be the way to go? So who knows what it's going to be three years from now? So we didn't say, what type of device. We're going to put some standards together, what the minimum standards should be, but I'm not going to try to predict uh, what the major technology uh, platforms are going to be three years from now. If I did, I'd be in a different job probably and talk with you on a different subject. But we know it's going to be different. We know there's going to be innovation. And uh, you know, as, as we've discussed, as you discussed last night, and as I've discussed with some of you uh, personally, 
Um, librarians have been the innovators at the classroom site. This is not going to be new to you. Uh, and uh, we just need to give you uh, the ability to do it and a few more colleagues to help you. We have a lot of outdated policy we're going to need to change uh, in order to make No Child Left Offline work. We're going to have to replace some outdated and unreliable technology. Um, as a lot of you know, we did the uh, technology readiness survey for the uh, Common Core Smarter Balance Assessments, and uh, we have a lot of uh, Windows XP that's still in use in your schools. Uh, and uh, it's working, uh, and it's also no longer supported by Microsoft. So we have some problems there that we need to deal with. But we think we're going to get there. And the other reason we believe education technology and this other innovation is going to work is the status quo is no longer the status quo. We have the Common Core that's been adopted. We have this new Smarter Balanced Assessment that is coming. We're no longer just going to focus on bubble tests. We are going to need to make sure our students learn to be able to do well on those new assessments. And uh, we also know, and we also are aware, uh, that uh, we don't want to add another major inequity to the system. We don't want students to get their first real experience with the computer type device the day they take their assessment. Oh. That is another potential inequity we have built into the system. One about which we are quite aware, uh, and uh, one of the reasons I'm going around talking about education technology around the state is we need to make sure that we are prepared for that because we don't need to add yet another glaring inequity uh, into our system. We are going to be continuing to work on this. And we're going to need your help, and we're going to need, uh, frankly, your support to make all of this happen. Uh, we added a library consultant because this is the direction we believe we are heading um, as a state. And uh, we believe that uh, we wanted to send that message, and we believe that you're going to need that help, so we should have an expert in the department able to do this type of work. We're also going to be uh, announcing a literacy campaign that I know some of you in this room have been working on. And thank you for that. Uh, because, you know, all the technology in the world is not going to work if our students can't read. Uh, so we need to make sure and one final point. It's, it, the other major policy lever we have uh, is with our awards programs. And uh, part of my portfolio is actually the Distinguished Schools Program. And we've been trying to expand it to make it look more like the blueprint for great schools. But something that is coming uh, is that we are going to be adding new levels of distinction uh, in, in various areas around the signature practices schools say they are using in order to uh, perform the way they are performing. And one of those areas is going to be the use of education technology. And uh, the rubric, as we put it together, I'm not going to try to outline the entire rubric, but I can tell you one element of that rubric is going to involve, in some way, teacher librarians. Wow. Make sure that <laughs> and I have learned that in this year and a half how really, really powerful the Distinguished Schools program is and what it can do. And so hopefully, just as adding arts last year has saved some arts programs around the state even before Prop 30 passed, now the Prop 30 is passed, and now that we're going to start reinvesting in our school system, hopefully the use of the awards program, hopefully this educator, education technology task force report, hopefully this new uh, teacher librarian role in the department, and hopefully the continued advocacy efforts by Superintendent Torlakson are all going to come together and instead of a perfect storm that you have faced over the last decade, or really since Proposition 13, if we're going to be fair about it. Hopefully now we can see a virtuous cycle so that when we're, the next time we talk, we're not talking about 51st in the nation and teacher librarians. We're getting back toward the national average and getting back to where we should be, where we were when Superintendent Torlikson was a classroom teacher and could rely on you for help in the top five in the nation. So thank you very much for the opportunity.
Well, is I right? Yes. 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 How are you feeling a little happy right now? Yes. Okay, not perfect, but better. Yes. Uh, a couple of things before we uh, move on. Um, you know, one of the things I love about school libraries and school librarians and the work that we do, we welcome just about anybody into our library. Isn't that true? <laughs> we'll even uh, invite a law administrator to come in here. <laughs> And so, yeah, we really do. And our, and our association has, for a long, long time, uh, pretty much said we want our, you know, uh, our library uh, technicians and our teacher librarians uh, to be here as a professional organization. But we're in a new century. And you know what? I think there's other people that are beyond us that could really stand to be members of our organization. Don't you think? Yes. Like, for example, that lady right there. <laughs> I mean, if anybody would deny her a membership, that's something wrong with you. We need her in our organization, and you know what? She needs us, and she said as much today. Well, in that spirit, Craig, like it or not, you are now a one-year member of the California School Library Association.